Okay, so uh, Professor Tree, uh, so can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Then uh, <laughs> let me introduce uh, Professor Yi Chui. The Professor Yi Chui is the director of the uh, Free Court Institute for Energy at Stanford University and the Fortinet, the Founders Professor at Stanford University. The Professor Chui has published more than 530 uh, papers and uh, one of the world most cited scientists with age index over 240. In 2014, he was ranked number one worldwide in the material science by uh, Thomas Reuter. And he is an associate editor of Nano Letters, and he has founded uh, five companies to commercialize technology. Okay, so let's welcome the Professor Chui. Well, thank you, Professor Idu Kim. Thank you for your invitation and introduction. Uh, I assume you hear me okay. Uh, let me spend the next 45 minutes uh, to uh, discuss about the topic of reinventing batteries through nanoscience. Uh, from previous talk, you have heard uh, Professor Zhi Chun Yi to talk about zinc. Uh, anode based batteries is very important chemistry for sure. Um, so we look at how the looking looking at the whole batteries feel, there's two major drivers right here. One is portable application, the other is stationary, integrated solar and wind electricity into the electrical grid, and also building integrated energy storage that's stationary as well. So these are the two different types of drivers right there really making the batteries research field very important, very exciting. It, it goes uh, really, really fast. Um, so what are the grand challenges right now we are facing for the batteries research? Uh, beyond what's been given to a Nobel Prize in uh, 2019 uh, on the uh, development of lithium-ion batteries. So it really come back to uh, some of the key questions, one of them is high energy density, how high energy density batteries can go. It is important to have high energy to uh, enable longer driving range, enabling also aviation. And it also helps reduce the cost as well because high energy density uh, is uh, will provide you the, the low cost, uh, potentially dollars per kilowatt hour. Second is, Hey, how about the battery's life? So far, the battery life is not long enough yet. Calendar life and or uh, cycle life. And the third is, can we do fast charging within 10 minutes? And then you can save the uh, charging infrastructure, particularly for uh, transportation. Uh, what about safety? So in previous uh, presentation, you have heard about how important the safety is. I completely agree. The current lithium ion uh, batteries are not safe enough. We need to address the safety problems. Maybe aqueous solution batteries chemistry will be helpful um, for some of the application, particularly stationary. And uh, it's also absolutely necessary to improve the lithium ion safety because lithium ion batteries has the high energy density. It is the, still the choice of the uh, solution for most mobile applications. Uh, reducing the cost by three times or more, battery reuse and recycling, and also the grid scale and seasonal energy storage. So these are the important questions my lab trying to adjust in the past 17 years since I joined the Stanford faculty. Uh, we work on high capacity materials such as silicon, lithium metal, phosphorus anode, and sulfur cathode. We look into solid polymer electrolyte and also ceramic uh, uh, solid electrolyte as well. We design strategy to enhance the battery safety. And we also we develop new chemistry for grid scale energy storage. At the same time, it's very important to have a uh, characterization technique can uh, the new type of uh, technique to understand how the batteries really work, such as uh, cryogenic electron microscopy. In the past uh, about five years, my lab has been developing. So let's look at the high energy density. 
this is still very important in the lithium system. Uh, existing beta is really based on intercalation mechanism of graphite anode, lithium cobalt oxide, MMC, or lithium ion phosphate, cath uh, phosphate cathode. And this atomic ratio of lithium to the host material is roughly one to six. It has a very small volume expansion. Vertical acids is a relative volume expansion. During charging, this charging is very small. This is often less than 10%. And but in order to store more energy, you're going to store more lithium ion. Now lithium to the host atomic ratio is increased tremendously, and until you hit to metallic lithium, there's no host atoms right there, uh, no host materials, so it's hostless. And the relative volume change is actually infinite because you're plating going to a field state. And then you strip going to empty states, then it's a relative, a relative sense is infinite. Um, so if you can enable this new uh, materials, uh, there's a huge payback as well. But the challenges you are facing is uh, this new material unstable host will have uh, much higher capacity. And then you will have uh, significant, significant chemical bond breaking for the host materials. Uh, house atoms move to long distance and complete structure change, huge volume expansion. So in the multiple land scale, designing materials in a different way uh, call, is calling for a paradigm shift uh, in the materials development. So, but if you could do that successfully, you can go beyond current uh, roughly 250 watt per kilogram go up to silicon and MMC, so it can be 400 or even a little bit higher. Metallic lithium and MMC, that's 500. And lithium sulfur can potentially, potentially get you to uh, 600 to even 1,000 watt per kilogram. So if you look at this, you know, this 500 watt per, per kilogram of the goal is actually the battery 500 consortium's uh, goal right here in the United States. Uh, I, I have serving as the co-director of this consortium. But the uh, materials challenging you're facing, using silicon as an example, is this 4,200 million mile per gram, very high capacity, and there's a very big volume expansion four times, and cause the materials breaking, and cause instability of a solid electrical interface. Uh, uh, many of you now have been working on silicon over 15 years now and uh, really started from silicon nanowires and uh, uh, silicon wires all for the uh, really the f uh, fastest stream relaxation and you can transfer electrons in and out fast and uh, maintain the electrical contact. And th this is the paper published back in January 2008, really uh, a set of the uh, the whole field of research of uh, use, using nano science design for uh, enabling the, the, the batteries. Um, so over the years, the understanding we build up, for example, using in situ transmission electron microscopy, right? building this individual nanowire uh, and TM device is, is a single nanowire batteries. You can charge and discharge, and you can put the particles right there allow us to observe the uh, volume change. For example, this is silicon nanowires uh, coated with uh, copper, and uh, the volume expansion takes place a lot. This is 200 nanometer scale bar right there. Right? The nanowires do not break, but what's broken is the copper coating on the surface. If you look at a particle, um, like a uh, um, much bigger particle here, and the center is 800 nanometer to start with. Lithium comes in and the volume expansion or silicon takes place. It actually forms a kind of core shell structure. You have crystalline core, amorphous lithiated silicon alloy shell. The rest of this particle expand a lot. It accumulates huge uh, stress. And eventually this, part, this particle could, cannot take the uh, stress anymore. And then it will break open. But the surrounding small particle, they will not break. So using a technique like this, we can identify the critical breaking size of the silicon particle. It's about 150 nanometers wide, so it's, it's roughly about 300 or so. So this has been teaching us a lot 
about uh, you know the high capacity materials, volume expansion, mechanical braking, the coupling of uh, chemomechanical properties, and guiding us the uh, design of the materials for the realistic batteries. So over the years since the nano wire, we have been through 12 generations of design from one to 12 right here. I will not go into the details. Uh, the reason I want to show you the silicon is to uh, uh, give you the history of the nano science for batteries, really uh, serious stuff from this uh, silicon nano wire paper, the, the nano design. I'm happy also to report back to you this uh, silicon nano wire and other silicon materials we uh, invented now have been uh, commercialized through my startup company, Ampere's. It generates up to 450 watt per kilogram of the batteries, supplied to the Airbus drone, flying for 25 days continuously uh, without stopping. During the day, there's a solar cell right there on, on this drone, charge up the batteries. But most of the time, the flying relies on the uh, high energy density silicon batteries. I'm also happy to report and uh, these uh, uh, batteries are based on silicon can do very fast charging within six minutes. It can charge to 80% of its capacity from empty to 80%. That's actually very fast. 450 watt per kilo, close to 1200 watt per liter of the batteries. So it, it's been also very exciting, quite a journey. The, the startup company I uh, founded, Empress, uh, uh, this year in September uh, 22nd, uh, and uh, went for public and uh, New York Stock Exchange. So this is the whole uh, uh, board, board and also the uh, leadership team. And this is all the uh, the, the the board members right there. Uh, uh, and, and this now has been uh, uh, sold in the commercial market, particularly for uh, those applications require very high energy densities. So beyond silicon, it's really now the holy grail in terms of high energy density. That's metallic lithium anode. Lithium metal has been studied for about half a century. And if you take a lithium metal foil, put it into an organic electrolyte, it's going to form the solid electrolyte interface, that's SCI. Once you do the plating, and the plating, there's no guarantee it's a flat layer by layer. It can do you can cause the surface topology change, cause, cause this curvature. Then you're going to pull open this SCI, it will cause the crack formation. Once the crack formation, lithium ion flux will just radially uh, diffuse to this crack much faster than the, the uh, location with SCI cow coverage. So you're going to have this lithium dendrite growth out uh, easily. Once you do the stripping, it's very easy to strip from the bottom. Then you're going to cause this isolated lithium metal formation. They detach away the underneath uh, lithium foil. They are not connected electrically anymore with the lithium foil. This causes uh, dead lithium formation. So before long, you're going to accumulate these dead layers. Capacity decay very fast. So during this process of lithium plating and stripping, for every one milliamp hour, it's five micron lithium, three milliamp hour or more, are typically, it's typically needed. We are going to be talking about 15 micron of lithium plating or more per surface, per side, per layer of electro. So once we have multi-layer stack of the electro, this causes very large volume fluctuation during charging and discharging. So how do we solve these problems? So we summarize. So and um, um, it summarize in the uh, what's the root causes of these problems, and then all these surrounding problems right there, and this uh, perspective article. Uh, now let me share with you some of the learning for the academia talk purpose. Num number one question is how does the lithium metal nucleate and grow, and this is very very important. From previous talk, Professor Zhi was uh, telling you about the case of zinc, why right? zinc has also this dendrite formation as well, right? Having this polar zinc generation and, and this metallic system of plating and stripping. And we got to understand the nucleation in the growth process. 
So if you look at lithium metal nucleation, a lithium ion, this is free energy plot. Uh, what's the reaction coordinate? Lithium ion become an electron, become lithium metal, and need to overcome these uh, energy barriers as th therefore nucleation. If particularly lithium deposition happen on, uh, uh, for example, copper, right? That's a heterogeneous nucleation. There's a barrier right there. Uh, even you increase its potential by uh, re by decrease the voltage and then you raise the electron energy, but you're still having uh, this nucleation barrier right there. So by looking at this uh, lithium nucleation process and uh, classical heterogeneous nucleation theory is teaching us the radius of the nuclei uh, scale with the over potential, one over, pot over potential. The number density, how many per areas, scale with a cubic function of the over potential. So if you if giving your high driving force to do the lithium metal nucleation, you're going to have a smaller nuclei, but much bigger number density of uh, nuclei, uh, nucleus. So by doing this deposition under different current density, we can assess different over potential nucleation deposits small amount of capacity. And this is what you expect to see. Um, small over potential, you're going to have formed this big nuclei, smaller density. Large over potential, you're going to form these uh, smaller nuclei, but with a large number of uh, uh, nucleus. So by playing with current density from the top, very low current density to the top left, by increase the current density slowly to the right, to the bottom is even higher current density. Now you look at the scale bar right here, and the 0 0.025 million per centimeter square, you see this really big nuclei. But if you go to 10 million per centimeter square, you see this very small nuclei, but the number density is a lot more for this high current density. So based on this study, right, if you do the plot, it's current density, the higher the current density, the more over potential you're going to have. The nu nuclear size is actually decreased with the scaling law is uh, one over over potential. And the nuclear size, uh, this is uh, another way to plot this. And the nucleation density, right? You look at that, it's actually scaled with cubic function of the uh, over potential. I won't go into details of that. But let me also mention, this is under the condition of like regular battery charging, discharging. Recently, we developed a technique using ultra micro electrode. This uh, electrode, a metallic wire, its uh, radius is only 12.5 micron. The side wall is insulated by the insulating layer. Only the tip, the end of the tip is uh, exposed, it's conducting. Then uh, you do the uh, cyclic voltammetry versus a lithium foil uh, as a counter electrode because it's only the end, the, it's a really only one point that's uh, having the deposition of the lithium. And the lithium ion diffusion profile is uh, uh, hemispherical. So it is a spherical type of diffusion profile. You, you are really can go into a regime, you are not limited by lithium ion diffusion that much anymore. So you can truly study the charge transfer. And because the deposition can happen so fast right there under high current density, and you can assess the uh, uh, lithium deposition without the SEL regime. So for example, if you scan this voltage right here, use different scan rate, you see in this region, it's actually kinetic, kinetically controlled, it's not diffusion control all this curve overlap. And this is very exciting because this microelectrode allow us to assess the current density of about 1,000 million per centimeter square versus the regular battery electrode is one to 10 million only. You are talking about three orders of magnitude or two orders to three orders of magnitude difference. And the deposition in the microelectrode happens just within seconds. So there is no SEI right there. So this is very exciting regime. For example, uh, on the top lab right here is under the microelectric deposition, current density is about a thousand milliamp, uh, milliamp per centimeter square. 
and it happened within seconds. And if you go to 10 million per centimeter square, this takes about 100 seconds to do. And then the bottom one, you start to see this uh, filament dendritic structure, but the top one is these well faceted particles. So it's very, very different. So even this is the same electrolyte ECDEC and the lithium PF6, but you can clearly see different morphology. That's because you're really de uh, doing deposition in the microelectrode in a very different regime. And you go in and look at that uh, carefully, this well fast electrode actually terminate the surface of the, each particle with this facet that's 110. Lithium metal is a BCC structure, 110, and this is the lowest energy surface for this lithium metal crystal. So now you can see you can access this beautiful, you know, a thermodynamically, uh, it's very surprising thermodynamically and this is fast deposition also very 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 well fasted uh, uh, crystal it's because it's uh, this deposition is so fast it's free of SEI so and now let's look at this uh, deeper lithium oftentimes our study right in the battery field oftentimes lithium they put deposition on copper you see an over potential right there has a genius nucleation, even under very low current density, this 10 microamp per centimeter square. Um, but if you deposit on gold, and uh, when the lithium metal deposition taking place right here, there's no over potential anymore. It looks like uh, there's no nucleation barrier right there. So what, what happened really here, and that's because lithium and copper and lithium and gold and the bottom right here, the phase diagram, let's look at the right hand side and close to pure lithium, you see uh, in lithium, copper has no solubility in lithium, but for gold, lithium has uh, can dissolve gold away. That means if you have gold as a substrate, lithium coming in, first they form this alloy phase, if you look at the phase diagram from left to right. But once before lithium deposition can happen, and actually lithium can already dissolve gold away, making gold more and more look like lithium and then that position happen. So this gradual change, change present no nucleation barrier right there, but lithium deposit onto copper. Copper has different crystal structure, different lattice uh, spacing, and lithium and copper matching is not so good. And uh, lithium deposition on copper is heterogeneous nucleation. There will be a nucleation barrier right there. In the 2016, this is first time we screen a bunch of the uh, metal, gold, silver, zinc, magnesium, aluminum, and so on. And the nucleation barrier is really, really low right here. No nucleation barrier. But copper, nickel, carbon have some nucleation barrier. By the way, this study in the back in 2016, I believe stimulate a lot of thinking in the battery field and by using we invented the term of uh, having this layer that liking lithium, right? This is kind of a lithophilic type of layers, helping the lithium nucleation and uh, many research groups and also companies utilizing this con concept and put down the relevant uh, coating uh, onto their, whether it's solid electrolyte, uh, whether it's their host to uh, uh, promote the lithium deposition. So, Back in 2016, it was the first time uh, we, uh, you know, present this concept to the world, and uh, I'm glad to see this benefit the many research groups research. So we actually designed experiment, have patterning the gold line onto copper. After lithium metal deposition, you see lithium light to grow onto where you have the gold line. They don't want, they don't like copper. So for the first time, this is collaboration with Professor Steve Chu. Um, and um, and we put the seeds into this hollow carbon sphere by hypothesizing if lithium deposition happened, this gold seed would have lithium metal nucleation inside and store inside this hollow carbon. They don't want to nuclear directly on the carbon outside. So we made this structure and uh, doing the synthesis and having this gold particle, many of them as the seed inside. Now let me share with you this in situ video. Inside the TEM, when we deposit lithium into this hollow carbon with the gold, once lithium coming in, you are going to see lithium has this ability 
to dissolve gold away. So this is consistent with our hypothesis. Now this lithium metal is filling in, uh, and we could also strip this lithium metal away as well. <laughs> Once it's stripped away, you can see this gold black dot uh, deposit out. It's a different location. Now you lithium that again, you're going to dissolve this gold uh, particle away. This is for the first time for us to have an idea to control spatially where lithium will go. So it allow us to design this uh, seeded uh, hollow particle as the electron, you deposit lithium in there. So they store inside. You don't see lithium matter deposition outside of this hollow sphere. But if you have hollow sphere alone, just a hollow uh, carbon sphere, you see this filamental structure deposition taking place. This confirms the concept of this uh, seeded, uh, lithiophilic seeded of a uh, particle to help doing spatial control is very important. So this indeed also just lead to our very exciting concept also by in 2016 of a host design of pre-store store lithium using a graphene oxide by molten uh, 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 lithium matter infusion. If you want to melt lithium to uh, store inside the host structure, you know, many of this carbon, you, uh, you see this uh, lithium metal after melting, the, it beats up that this is in glass box. But in graphene oxide, it actually wet, it melts, it goes in and stops between the graphene oxide layer. So this is uh, also, this is really the first time we, uh, I think, uh, this affiliate concept was uh, uh, first time uh, con by uh, my research group. So it's very clear. It's graphene oxide. You put it into lithium metal. This is molten lithium. This is a spark generated. And after spark reaction, actually, actually the layer sp spacing open up, you put this uh, reduced graphene oxide into this molten lithium. And the, the uh, spacing between graphene oxide is in the nanometer to 100 nanometer scale. It's going to pulling in this uh, molten lithium. You're going to see this golden color and uh, showing up. It's now it's lithium metal stored between the uh, uh, graphene oxide and making this uh, whole composite as a uh, really a golden color. It's really simi similar to when lithium and turquoise to graphite, actually graphite become golden color as well. So we have been showing using this whole structure, we can store lithium, it have stable cycling, I won't go into details of that. So let me come to the second question, an important one we would like to answer. That is, is the isolated lithium metal really dead? I was showing you, you know, you do doing that position is stripping, you form this uh, lithium filament, it get isolated, it's often called dead lithium. So the end of last year, my lab had reported this discovery. This is my postdoc founder just joining uh, University, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison as faculty uh, several months ago. And under and the uh, uh, bathed geometry, you have this isolate, detached lithium in the middle. You have cathode, you have anode. Well, it turned out to be during the bathed cycling, you are charging between anode and cathode, even this, though there's no electron passing through this electrolyte. line. But because you have ionic current inside, so you are going to have a, a, a you know electrical field uh, setting up once you pass current. This electrical field will polarize these uh, uh, lithium filament. In a sense, it want to maintain a metal, metallic structure inside with a zero electrical field. So you're going to polarize in a way, if electrical field in the charging process going from left to right, you're going to accumulate positive charge at the tip uh, on the right-hand side of this dendrite. Uh, that means electron will move to the left, accumulate negative charge right there. If you accumulate positive charge, this is really driving lithium zero, now become lithium ion plus electron, and electron will move to the left, but lithium ion will dissolve into the electrolyte. This is what happened on the right-hand side. But the left-hand side is the opposite, the reverse reaction, lithium ion, pick up an electron, become lithium metal, it get deposited on the left. So what's happening is right-hand side get dissolved away, left-hand side will have deposition happening. This is during charging. So what happened is this dendrite will move 
to the left. Uh, because the right side dissolve, left side deposition happening, you move to the left. But if it's still in discharge process, electric field is the opposite. What happened is the opposite. Now it's the left side having polarizer being the positive will dissolve away. Right side will have the deposition. So this uh, filament will now move to the right. This, so if we move to the right uh, enough, if it's not too far away from metallic lithium anode during discharge process, this uh, 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 lithium metal dendrite can get connected and get activated. Now the dead lithium is alive. So what we uh, want to say right here is this dead lithium is not really dead. It may be just hibernating. It can be activated. This is really important. Now you can reactivate metallic lithium to re re uh, recover its capacity. So we designed an experiment to prove that pattern this metallic island during charging process at the beginning, right? Lithium metal, golden color, uh, uniformly distributed. After three hour charging process outside between MNC and lithium, you see lithium metal now move to the, move to the left. And, uh, during this charge process, it actually moved to the right. You see more golden color on the right. So this is very exciting through, uh, uh electrochemical simulation. We can actually regenerate this process during charging and discharging and see how these um, metallic lithium islands then I could move back and forth and uh, responding to the uh, external electrical current. Uh, we actually have done full study of uh, what's the scaling rule, how high of the uh, potential uh, you generated uh, the voltage difference between the two ends of the electrode. The longer the dendrite it is, the higher the potential you're going to accumulate it. So I will skip this. This indeed is the first time we demonstrate isolated lithium can be activated. This has a very important implication to uh, how do you recover capacity, extend the battery life. That's number one. The second one is for fast charging of the batteries, even if it's lithium iron, it's very likely under fast charging, you are going to uh, nuclear the lithium metal dendrite in the graphite uh, anode or lithium or silicon anode. Now we have a way to recover that. And even during the, through the watch curve, we can detect that. And this help us to enable fast charging as well. So, uh, let me now show you the uh, last example on the uh, uh, related to still in the lithium metal system. And it's very important we can have high resolution imaging of uh, our battery material and their interface. That's a solid electric interface. So um, these are uh, lithium dendrite and many other battery material are highly fragile. This is lithium metal dendrite. If you zoom in inside TEM, the room temperature, you are going to destroy this dendrite very fast before you can take any image. So it was completely a surprise, right, for decades. And uh, we have never seen, I was a trustable atomic scale resolution of metallic lithium uh, through using TEM. We never saw that. So that's because they're so sensitive to the E-beam. And uh, back in 2017, uh, and, uh, indeed we did this way in 2016 and submitted, uh, 2016. It took a long time to reveal because this is the first paper to develop cryogenic electron microscopy for uh, sensitive battery materials. Uh, Yizhang and Yan Bing were my two, uh, graduate students and at the time, Yizhang joined in UCLA faculty for a couple of years now. Um, and, uh, they developed this lithium metal deposition on the TM grid. Pumps freeze into liquid nitrogen, very, very cold temperature. And in liquid nitrogen temperature, nitrogen does not react with lithium metal. But if it's room temperature nitrogen gas in the air, it will react. So maintaining liquid nitrogen temperature, we develop this cryo transfer process into the TM so we can do the image and see in the first, for the first time, atomic scale resolution of this uh, uh, lithium atom column. This allow us to study the crystallography orientation of a dendrite, what's the long axis, what's the sidewall facet. So it's been a really fascinating. I will not go into detail of that. It's also for the first time now, 
now we can resolve the uh, debate about solid electron interface. What's the structure? The structure of this SCI, this uh, mosaic model proposed is this patch of different composition uh, 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 together, uh, you know, forming a mosaic pattern. It can be also, this also proposed a structure model that's layer with inorganic close to the end now, but organic more on the top. But what's exactly the structure? It, it, it's been debated. Now using Cryo EM, we can resolve this uh, uh, SCI structure. This now we can see is this inorganic grain or lithium oxide embedded into this organic, presumably mostly organic matrix. This is under ECDEC electrolyte. But as soon as you add in the uh, FEC, fluorinate, ethylene carbonate, and it becomes the uh, bilayer structure. But it is the uh, uh, inverted bilayer because it's now you see this beautiful inorganic lithium oxide coating on the outer wall and this amorphous layer in the bottom close to uh, the lithium metal. So it's an inverted uh, uh, multi-layer model right, right there. Indeed, also for the first time, we can correlate uh, the SCI structure with the electrochemical performance that's a columbic efficiency, charging and discharging uh, the uh, charge efficiency right there. Uh, this uh, bilayer uh, structure having a lot more uniform SCI and to give you a much higher columbic efficiency than the mosaic type of SCI. So let me update you this year. And um, we have been asking the question, the uh, previous uh, uh, Cryo EM study is on the lithium dendrite with SCI already dry up the electrolyte, dry up the solvent. So it's a dry state. But what's really the intrinsic state is this uh, electron material that's so inside the electrolyte. We want to see the uh, intrinsic, uh, I will call it as a wet state. And but how to prevail, prepare the wet sample is actually very, very challenging. In collaboration with Professor Wa Chu and uh, uh, our joint student, Zhe Wen, developed this uh, plotting paper technique, learning from biology. You can prepare your sample with lithium uh, uh, metal dendrite right there, but you have this thick liquid. Now blotting away most of the liquid, but still leaving behind very thin layer. And then we do air free transfer and freeze in the cryogen, such as the liquid nitrogen. And now for the first time, this is bottom row. After this blotting technique, you can get a dendrite embedded into organic electrolyte. They are already frozen and the liquid nitrogen temperature uh, in the richer state. The top case is the one if you have too much electrolyte right there, the equator form is very, very messy, very thick layer. It's very hard to image under the uh, TEM. So um, now in the SCI, in the wet state, in the richest uh, state, we can see this the layer of this SCI, for example, is about 20 nanometer for the same uh, electrolyte, if the SCI is in a dry state right here, certainly dry state imaging is more clear, it's only about 10 nanometer. So the thickness difference is about double. Uh, uh, it's a double. So this is really telling us the SCI in the electrolyte is in a swollen state. It's swell in a lot of liquid. And um, so we actually now, Looking at uh, these uh, dry state and the richified state, and one electrolyte, for example, using ECDEC lithium PF6, and another electrolyte at the FEC, and this DME right here, there's a uh, four mole of DME high concentration. This is, is FDMB, the uh, silver star electrolyte, and measure the thickness of dry state in the, in the richified state. There's actually a, a very strong correlation of performance that's columbic efficiency, the higher the better versus the SCI swelling ratio. That's defined as the uh, SCI thickness in the wet state uh, versus the uh, SCI thickness in the dry state. Um, now you see that if the swelling ratio is high, your columbic efficiency is low. If it's a less swelling, the columbic efficiency is high. This is indeed very exciting because of this high performance electrolyte indeed has more inorganic component right there. It will swell 
less in the electrolyte condition. The reason it has a, a, a more inorganic component is because it's a lithium solvation environment, lithium ion has more anion and uh, a reduced number of solar molecules. Solar molecule tend to generate organic SEI, but this inorganic anion right there will generate is uh, more inorganic rich SEI, which is the less swelling behavior. Now this becomes so exciting from the structure, from composition, from electrochemical performance, that's chromic efficiency, also from the solvation structure of lithium. Now we call it like everything together for the first time and, and, and becomes a, a very powerful tool for us, other to understand, for us to understand, you know, the performance of the electrolyte and that guide us the design of a future generation of even better electrolyte. So in my last five minutes, maybe I'll spend two minutes to touch upon a little bit of long duration energy storage. Mm -hmm. Professor Zhu uh, in previous mentioned, you know, the safety is so important and also the cost is so important. So for stationary energy storage, it, it, it's probably not the lithium ion. That's the ideal solution, even though it's very strong contenders, mm -hmm. right? For, but it could be other technology could be better. And for grid scale energy storage, you require for minutes to hours a day to week, months, and seasonal storage. And, and this huge amount of battery really needed, assuming you store the whole electricity for 72 hours only, it requires 200 terawatt hour of the batteries, right? This is huge market right there. Considering also, also the transportation require a lot of batteries, this adding together, we are talking about 300 terawatt hour of batteries. Nowadays, we can only the yearly production globally, including the plant factory not built yet, is only one terawatt hour per year production. This requires 300 years to produce. So we need to scale up the battery yearly production 10 to 30 times in order to meet the uh, uh, net zero by uh, 2050. And uh, we need to uh, look into different chemistry, having a lot more abundant uh, uh, materials and elements available for us to use. So I'm going to skip just directly saying, hi, hey, you know, current lithium ion is, cannot satisfy the, the grid scale need. It's a, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't, it's for the grid scale storage, we need to have all climate condition, very hot, very cold and very long cycle life, very safe, easy to, to recycle at low cost. And lithium ion is uh, uh, having, uh, I'd say, some challenges right there for sure. So let me share with you, um, uh, about four years ago, we published this paper on the nickel hydrogen gas batteries. This is beautiful chemistry cathode using nickel hydroxide, nickel oxide hydroxide, and then using water become hydrogen. And, and if you look at each of these reactions, uh, nickel chemistry has a very long life, a hundred thousand cycle. Hydrogen chemistry right here can be infinite. Basically, you're talking about million cycles right there. This com combination allow you to generate very long life batteries, 30 years, 30,000 cycles and so on. So in my lab, I've been seeing amazing performance, 10,000 cycle after that, you still have 95% capacity retention. This is aqueous solutions chemistry is very safe. Even the people think, oh, this hydrogen in there. Hey, but I'm telling you, we are testing a very big uh, battery cell and uh, put into the fire, shooting on bullet, and then it, it remains to be very, very safe. Very impressive chemistry right here. And also not only that, uh, from the cathode side, there's uh, even low cost as the manganese, 10 times low cost than nickel, right? lead and iron. So we also, back in 2018 and developed and published a manganese hydrogen gas batteries. Inventing a manganese is a manganese dissolution and deposition mechanism. And it's just beautifully combined with hydrogen to form a manganese hydrogen uh, gas battery. So then after that, there's a many version of the uh, cathode and hydrogen gas combination as the battery we invented, particularly with my previous post Wei Chen who is now in USTC as a faculty. So I want to share with you, I spun our company called Innovanil, and Innovanil is building up with really big size batteries right there. This is a very long life battery, 30 years, 30,000 cycle, zero accident, very safe. 
it's very flexible for minutes to 72 hour storage. Zero maintenance, it can go to very low temperature, minus 40 to a plus 60 degrees Celsius without air conditioning needed. This uh, aqueous solution is so robust and with uh, 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 with salt in there, it can go down to minus 40 without freezing. So, and when it's building these uh, shipping containers, starting to ship product to the uh, customer, uh, it's indeed very, very exciting to see in the van is signing up for seven gigawatt hour of, uh, uh, contract. Uh, this is a pre-order from uh, many companies. Uh, this is absolutely amazing chemistry. So now let me end my talk just by summarizing. Uh, I'm giving you the example of how materials, particularly, uh, nano science approach can help design the materials to enable very exciting chemistry for uh, a battery energy storage. Uh, let me end my talk by thanking the whole research group of Battery Final Consortium, the OSBMR program, and the BES Material Science Division program as well. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take any questions you have. Uh, thank you very much for very interesting and excellent presentation, Professor Chui. Uh, we have uh, several questions, so uh, I will take uh, some of them. Uh, thank you for your intriguing the lecture on chapter two. The dead lithium is depicted as a needle-like structure. If the aspect ratio of dead lithium shrink enough, does the electric field can still direct the dead lithium species? Um, <clears throat> if it's uh, one dead lithium right there, the left side let's say uh, dissolve away. The right side deposition so it just move, keep going. Um, then you might be asking the situation if what if this stand dry is a very short, right? Then the voltage, uh, from left to right is that the potential difference will be small. Then the movement will be small. That's for sure. But hopefully this stand dry is uh, close enough to the anode. Even a tiny movement can help reconnect it. But I think this question is right. If it's uh, the longer danger has more driving force to move, shorter danger has less. That's uh, that's absolutely cor correct. Thank you. And next question. Uh, thank you for your beautiful talk. And I wonder if there is an optimum size of nucleation seed. Also, I'm curious that uh, there is some difference between the seed inside host and outside host for lithium dendrite growth. Um, so are you asking about that CD growth? Um, that go to particle, you know, we, we have a variety of size in there. So the gold, uh, lithium coming in, dissolve gold away. Gold is like nucleation seed, uh, to have this aeroid. So far, we have not seen, um, the size dependence yet for the gold seeds, whether a uh, bigger one will be a lot more effective than smaller one. Yeah, that's a good question. So we haven't seen that. So let, let me, within a minute, I probably couldn't think deeper and say there's any difference. So far, we haven't seen it. Yeah. But the number densities, uh, distribution of the gold seed inside this carbon house, my effect, real effect, the current, how high current density you can do. Because the more nuclei you have, and uh, you're easy to intake lithium more, and uh, I will, you will be able to access a uh, higher current density uh, for the uh, uh, deposition. Thank you. And next question. Uh, thank you for your very impressive lecture. I have a question about the swollen SEI in Science 2022. SEI components are by product from the electrolyte. And why SEI in LIFSI electrolyte is not swollen to compare to the other electrolyte? Um, so the uh, the electrolyte uh, is no, it's salt is one thing. It's mainly the solvent. Um, so the solvent, different solvent will have degree of uh, solvation. And the weak solvation, solvent, will tend to populate more anion in the solvation shell. Once it forms the SCI, you're going to form more of the inorganic. That means anion-rich SCI, that's more inorganic. 
So that will be a uh, swollen less. We know organic will swell more, right? That's the reason. It's really mostly is the solvent driven. It's not the anion uh, uh, driven as much. But anion will have some effect, that's for sure, because anion binding with lithium with different strength will, will have some effect. It's mostly here dominated by solvent. Okay, then uh, uh, we have a total 10 questions, but the last question from the graduate student. What are the strengths of the nickel, mangan, hydrogen battery system compared to the oxygen battery system, such as lithium ion battery and zinc ion battery? Oh, uh, our cycle life is so much longer. <laughs> cycle number, lifetime, and also the engineering design. Uh, uh, right, it's so much uh, easier. We also know the uh, we know the zinc air, the air batteries, but right? the air side is so challenging because <laughs> face the air coming in is all kind of component, you know, uh, solvent evaporation, solvent oxidation if it's organic, if it's aqueous, then evaporation. And, and there's, there's no comparison right here. Our cycle life is so much longer. Energy efficiency also, by the way, it's a wrong to energy efficiency. Ours is 85%. It's so much higher. We look at all the air system as well, 50%, 40% easily by energy efficiency only, yeah. Okay, and uh, congratulations, uh, Amplius IPO. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> and also, the, I have a question about the Thank production you. cost of the silicon nanowire. Also, uh, scale up may reduce the cost, but uh, so how about the production cost the, at current stage? Um, the production cost at this moment is higher than uh, the uh, usual lithium ion, that's for sure. Otherwise, we probably already populate the market <laughs> really <laughs> a lot. Um, I don't have the detailed number right here at this moment. This uh, production is uh, cost seems to be okay for drone application, certainly going to electric transportation will need to reduce the cost more. That's why uh, this IPO uh, allow us to raise uh, quite a bit of capital to build the uh, production line to reduce the cost. Okay, so thanks for kind answer. Then I would like to thank the Professor Yi Chui again for a very impressive presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>